Of all the podcasts in all the town and all the world, Django Fett had to walk into mine. It's harmless phosphorescence. Hello, everyone. This is Thoreau Smiley, and I think Humphrey Bogart looks great in a leather corset and heels. Who's joining me this week? <laughs> I'm Josh Cece, and I want 20 grand in unmarked Canadian loonies in a big bucket. Barbara Kopetsky died in the war. I'm Brian Lesh. <laughs> if one more person calls me babe, I'm Alaric Weber. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Okay, babe. <laughs> hey, babe. <laughs> This is like our chicken for Marty McFly. <laughs> yeah. Al goes crazy when Flea calls him babe. <laughs> that wasn't Flea, was it? In the uh it, it looked, looked just, just like him. him. In, in, in the, the future? future? Was Flea in Back to the Future? No. Oh, in, in Back, Back to the Future. I thought we were talking about this movie. Uh, oh no, 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 in Back to the Future, yeah. Um he was in Flea was in the truck, wasn't he? In the in the truck that was no, taunting I think Marty he was McFly. In two. I think he was one of the futuristic like. No, but wasn't in the second one when they called him Chicken in the truck and he decided not to race? Wasn't that when, when they, they run into the the, the poop? No, 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 not not in the first one. Like in the second or third one, when Marty learns his lesson and doesn't get mad at being called Chicken anymore. Ten, Ten seconds, seconds in, and we're already arguing God about a different it. movie. <laughs> This is Harmless Phosphorescence, the podcast where we argue about movies that we haven't seen recently. <laughs> Guilty. <Wow. laughs> and we watch every theatrically released full-length live-action superhero movie ever made. We gather some research he, into the production. He is the guy in the truck, but it says uh, Back to the Future 2 and 3. Okay, yeah, and I know because he didn't have the chicken thing in the first one. They introduced that in the second movie. <laughs> All right. So uh, this show is brought to you by our patrons. Patrons like executive producers Michael Beckwith and Atticus Burkett. You want to be a patron too? It's easy. Go to patreon.com slash harmless entertainment. We got lots of bonus content there. Uh, we just put Jack and Jill up a few weeks ago. We just recorded Encino Man. That should be up any time now. And uh, these are ones that you cannot get on our main feed. So if you like listening to us digress... <laughs> then go to patreon.com. Have we, we got, got the digressions, digressions for you? Oh, my yeah. Lord. No, you think All we digress it. on this? You should see when we're recording late at night for our monthly movies. This digression <laughs> will not stand, man. <laughs> this week, though, on Harmless Phosphorescence, we're watching Barb Wire. Music! <laughs> I'm sorry. Arr. I'm sorry that. Oh my gosh. Okay, Barb uh, Wire. Hey, who whose turn is it to make, make snacks this, this week? week? Barb. <laughs> Why was it so important that they distinguish that she's not a cop in the trailer? So that they know she's a badass. Like she's not. <laughs> she, she's not the man. I mean, they, I mean, they would have called, called it Officer, Officer Wire. Wire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's because it's, it's, it's a propaganda movie for Proposition Fuck You. <laughs> uh, um, Barb Wire was released May 3rd, 1996. A running time of 98 minutes. It cost $9 million and it made $3.8 It 
bombed. Um, yeah. bombed was this Warner Brothers? Mm, but this is before the DC mm, stuff was bought by them. Yeah. It, well, no, I thought they, they always, always had it. it. They they did. This was um, Warner Brothers didn't care enough about this. It wasn't. I mean, it was Dark Horse. So it wasn't like technically DC, but it was okay. obviously dark. yeah. This was uh, Gramercy and Polygram and propaganda films. <laughs> Nobody really yeah. wanted to take responsibility for this one. Well, I mean, when did the Tommy Lee tape uh, happen? What year was that? That was that for this. That was after was that? this. I think. I think it was like oh, okay. 97, 98, somewhere around there. I remember it being big in 99 because we were living La Vida Loca. Um, uh-huh. but I feel but like, like there was something, something like that, 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 that. I mean, obviously, obviously the, the movie, movie is, so, but I feel like there was something politicized or publicized that made this, that interfered with her promoting this or it being taken seriously. I'll have to look up when the video came out. Yeah, I'm. Hmm. I didn't really see much about it, but I didn't look into that because I, I was thinking the video was afterwards. Um, it didn't do well either way, and I think that right. means it's time we play the box office top 10 game. This is the game where I will describe the top 10 movies of the week and the of uh, May 3rd, 1996. And the uh, fellas here are going to try to guess which movie I'm describing Spoilers, Barbed Wire did not open in the top 10. Uh, Number 12 came in at 12. Um, Did half its money that first weekend and then just fell off. It did not have good word of mouth. Um, So (laughs) jumping in here, guys, you ready to play? Yes. All right. Here we go. The number 10 movie of the week of May 3rd, 1996. In 1950s L.A., a special crime squad of the LAPD investigates the murder of a young woman. That is the best description of this movie that will. Yeah. Is it L.A. Confidential? Absolutely not. This movie, you are never going to guess this movie from that description, and I didn't change a word. Long (sighs) came a spider. I'm trying to think of other L.A. murder movies. Um, this movie. In 1950s. Oh, 50s L.A. Oh, the two oh, Jacks? No, you know what? I keep getting this mixed up with the other movie that has the similar title. Um, this is one I didn't see. It stars uh, Malkovich, Nolte, Griffith, Madsen, Penn, Chris, not Sean. Huh. It's And the, the outbreak, outbreak monkey. monkey. Yeah, it's Mulholland <laughs> Falls. Oh, I have oh. heard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's like one of those accidental, I got this from Blockbuster. I meant to get Mulholland Drive. Exactly. <laughs> Every single time. Yeah. It's like, I don't remember Nick yeah. Nolte. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Wait, somebody, somebody got, got murdered? murdered? I, thought I thought this was a fucking romance. romance. Uh, opening at number nine this week. Oh, fuck this shit. Okay. A young man's life is thrown into a loop when he's asked to be a pallbearer for the funeral of a classmate he doesn't remember. And his old high school crush temporarily returns to town. Uh, Starring Gwyneth Gwyneth Paltrow and David Schwimmer. What? I actually remember watching this. I think it was one of those things where if you... There was simply nothing else at Blockbuster. Um, and they, they made, made any movie in the 90s. It didn't, it didn't matter what, what it was. was. They're like, let's, let's make it. Let's do it. Oh, my God. Yeah. That David Literally Schwimmer shot. poster. <laughs> I just want to punch him. Um, it's The Paul Bearer. Oh, right. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. They made a whole movie called The Paul Bearer. Yeah, starring David Schwimmer. About I it. just love that it's, it's about, about him. him. The guy. This, it, t- he's, he's making, making it about, it about himself, himself, man. He, he always does, does this. this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like carry the casket, casket funeral's over. Go, go kiss, kiss your friend. friend. Whatever. I was gonna try to do a Schwimmer impression, and then realized I didn't know what it was, and realized I was just gonna about to do Seinfeld. <laughs> it's right. just like panic, panic to the, the point, point that you almost piss, piss your pants. pants. That's, That's my Schwimmer impression. Ooh. <laughs> uh, did this have the monkey from Outbreak? 
Yeah, the Paul Bearer. It should have. <laughs> that, it, it was in the casket. Did he really have a monkey? No, I'm um, friends, friends, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Ross had a monkey. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Fair. Rachel, I don't know. I thought we were on a break. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the deal? I think I, I think a little pee came out of me. I hate, so much. I hate that show so much. Yeah. Uh, at number eight this week, an orphan who lives with his two cruel aunts befriends anthropomorphic bugs. <laughs> And James, James and the, the Giant, Giant Peach. Peach. Absolutely. Yeah. Fucking lootly. James and the Giant Peach. I love this movie. I was there the day it came out. I was a big roll doll, like, obsessed little kid. Oh, yeah. Also. Yeah, no, I dug this one, but it was uh, that, like, adult hot topic kind of love. Oh, well, that's fair. That's fair. I, it was very much a, like, is this movie frightening or is this movie really pretty? I was, I was like, 10 years old. And the answer is both. Yeah, it's... Uncanny Valley through and through. Yeah, no, that because well, that was that same guy, right, Henry Selleck. Henry Selleck, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, he has, he has that, that Disney, Disney like just walk up to creepiness, walk up to scariness. Yeah, yeah. At anyone who's sleeping on it, check out um, his new one um, on a uh, uh, Netflix. Um, uh, oh crap! What's it called? Um, it just came. Oh. Wendell and Wild. Oh, oh. yeah. Uh, Key and Peele. <laughs> star in it it's great that's awesome um at number seven this week a couple agree to pretend to be something they're not so their son can introduce them to his fiance's parents the birdcage the birdcage oh i was muted yeah I love this movie yeah i haven't oh, seen it since the oh, 90s so i'm I, I hear it where yeah. it holds up though it really right. holds very well. Yeah. It holds yeah. up. Maybe, Maybe even, even more, more considering the climate at the moment. Yeah, yeah I, I saw, saw it like four, four or five years ago and was just dying the whole time. So I watch every, every now and then. The, the performances, performances are just gorgeous. And, and Nathan Lane, Lane is so like, he's, he's playing such a subtle character. character. Oh, and, yeah. Which, which is, is, yeah, it's so great. Yeah. Have you guys seen um, the clips? Of uh, him and Robin Williams on Oprah for when this came out. Uh, oh yeah, yeah that was where famous story. Oprah's like yeah. trying to like kind of out him a little bit, and like Robin Williams like just jumps in and like covers. He's like, literally, it's like yeah. it's not your fucking place to do that, Oprah. <laughs> like right. it's Nathan Lane. We can all tell, but it's not your place to do that. Right. right. She, she was, was trying, trying to sort of bait him. Like, him. like it, it seems, seems like, like this role came easy for you. you. It, it seemed like, like you know, you were meant to play. play you know. Mm -hmm. So she was. Totally, totally trying, trying to bait, to and yes, yeah. the incomparable Rob Williams. Yeah. yeah. It's like, like, I have a funny, funny story. story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Robin Williams, man. We didn't, we didn't deserve him. him. <sighs> no, we didn't. He's like dogs. He's not like a dog, but yeah, yeah. he was too good for this world. <laughs> absolutely. I, I don't want to go too far down the Robin Williams tangent. Have I? Have you guys listened to Dave Chappelle's podcast at all? Mm -mm. There's, there's, it's, it's not on normal podcast, podcast places they do it on luminary whatever whatever but there's a clip of him on youtube talking about robin williams coming to uh what's the new york comedy store um the uh, improv or gotham or uh, oh um yeah what is it it's the downstairs one right right the comedy cellar the comedy cellar thank you so dave was at the comedy cellar with most death and most death accidentally gets real stoned but it's most and Dave telling the story of Robin Williams coming up and rapping with most death and like chopping it up and then doing a little bit of stand up and then bouncing um, and then died shortly thereafter. Oh, uh, but it's a really, really, really cool, touching story about Robin Williams. And I didn't expect him to, you know, mingle with those guys like that. You know, it's kind of cool. Ever. <laughs> he was in uh, he was one of the last people to see Belushi alive. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah, yeah, he was he was one of those guys everybody knew him and he knew everybody. Well, I really I really, I really appreciate Mulaney's one of the big ones, but a lot of comics that um, constantly come to his defense about the bullshit about like, oh you have to be sad and miserable to do comedy and he killed himself because he was depressed and could and yeah, I just like the comedians rushing, like that's bullshit. Absolutely that, you know, bullshit. Yeah. The the disease he had was insane. If you read about yeah. what he was actually going through, it had nothing to do with depression. Yeah. No. Nothing. 
Imagine that mind not able to access itself mm-hmm. like it used to. Oh. One of the fastest minds on the planet. Oh my god. No, I still I remember being about like being like 16 years old sitting at home getting high and just watching a 1984 Robin Williams stand up and just like live, live at the, the Met losing my live at the Met that it was yeah. it was a San Francisco one I saw that I watched over and over again but I'm sure it was a lot of the same material but um it was like just fucking incredible that man like <laughs> brought to you by cocaine at that point he's, he's really oh, yeah. good in this too he's really good at barbed wire yeah. God damn it. Okay. Yes. At number six at the box office for the week of May 3rd, 1996. A lawyer assigned... Wow, this is not what I thought this movie was from the title. A lawyer assigned to the clemency case of a woman on death row finds himself forming a deep friendship with her while he tries to prevent her impending execution. I I thought this was a, an entirely different movie. I'm going to say like the Pelican Brief. Um, that's not it though. The, the, those. It's it's yeah. I mean, basically, it's the the tagline is sometimes justice is a crime. Starring Sharon Stone in Last Dance. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's a movie none of us remember. Opening at number five this week is this a? Yeah, it, it suffered. It suffered from no bad shot. Yeah. Uh, op- <laughs> opening at number five this week. I don't even want to. I'm not even going to describe it. I'm just going to read the uh, the the cast, starring Sam Jackson, Jeff Goldblum, Peter Berg, Jamie Fox, Damon Wayans, and John Lovitz. Oh. An overrated chump, an overweight champ. No matter who ends up on top, only one man can be king. A boxing champ's promoter thinks change is needed. He finds the one man who's beaten his black champ at 17, a white man now in a rock band. Like Rocky, he trains heavily, whereas the champ slacks. What What is is this description? This is a (laughs) winding road, man. This is The Great White Hype. Oh, Oh, I remember this movie. So do I. Stupid. Yeah. The 90s were weird, man. (laughs) The 90s were crazy. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that opened at number five. At number four this week, an altar boy is accused of murdering a priest. And the truth is buried several layers deep. I okay. I mean, oh, this is primal something, right? Primal fear. I have not seen this movie. Um, I vaguely, vaguely remember it existing, but one hundred percent, like the priest molested the kid, right? That's the story. <laughs> That's the story. Um, yeah, I remember talking to somebody about how I didn't really like Richard Gere, and they're like, "Oh, watch this movie. You'll, it'll change your mind." It did not. No, Richard Gere's weird. Like his career, his place in pop culture, everything. That dude's, that's weird. It's a weird yeah, thing, just, the existence of Richard Gere. I've just pretty, never seen Pretty woman, that's, that's it. it. That's, that's all he's got. No, but Officer and a Gentleman. That was fucking like, like. Amer- American Gigolo. American Gigolo. Like he was a dude. Like he was a, like he, he was, I don't know. He's weird. I don't get it. I don't understand it. He, he always, always plays, plays that, that same, same character, character too. too. It's never yeah. any variety. Yeah. yeah. Um, at number three this week, a group of gentlemen. I'm going to leave out some words here to make this funnier. Visit a legendary lost city located in Tibet. They plan to steal a priceless statue during the martial arts tournament. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> no. Oh. Street Fighter. It's a Van Damme. Oh. Uh, a lost um, city. A man of destiny. A test of honor. This is fury. It's called The Quest. Go the distance. Wow. And, and what, what, what what was this at? What, was, what number did this open at? Um in three. its in its uh, <laughs> second week of release it was at number three. 
Oh, geez, man. It would go on to do 13 million, so it wasn't like a runaway hit or anything, but... Uh, like, I don't remember that movie existing at all. I don't remember a lot of Van Damme movies or their titles or their plots, but that was number three? Mm-hmm. I guess, I guess that's, that's like, like a, a uh, Fast and the Furious kind of light kind of thing. Like, people go right. to see their favorite action star, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of... Fast and Furious is what's... What's uh, holding that down these days? I can't, I can't imagine, imagine that that's, that's better than this, this though. And this, this has boobs in it. <sighs> it's just crazy. <laughs> it's crazy to me that this movie doesn't get the respect that it's due. We'll get that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, spoilers. Brian may or may not. <laughs> Brian's opinions may or may not represent the rest of us. <laughs> Myself specifically. I can't speak for Josh or Al. Um, at number two this week. A successful veterinarian with low self-esteem asks her friend to impersonate her when a handsome man wants to see her. I thought this movie was kind of cute when it came yeah. out. Was it The Truth About Cats and Dogs? The Truth About Cats and Dogs. Uma Thurman and Janine Garofalo. Janine Garofalo is the vet. Uma Thurman's the hot best friend. Janine Garoppolo is so hot, though. She was, oh my so. God. She She's was always adorable. She I was, always hated that she would be, yeah, like, like plain, typecast as plain. No. Like, that works for me. I don't know. I don't know what you guys are talking about. No, because about. she's smart and sarcastic. She can't be hot. Right. Like, whatever. I was just going to say, yeah. you can't be funny and hot in Hollywood, one or the other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fuck you, Hollywood. Um, oh, God. Yeah. Right in the second, second butthole you obviously had. This, this is, is a, a proposal, proposal, Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood, fuck you. Pay your writers. It's and a proposition. <laughs> it's a proposition. <laughs> proposition. Thank you. <laughs> it's a proposal. I was just getting right to the right to the second You're part. proposing, Brian? <laughs> to the entire state of California. <laughs> Will you make me the happiest man? I do. <laughs> and opening I at, do. And opening at number one this week. A newcomer to a Catholic prep school. Falls in with a trio of outcast teenage girls. Hmm. Clueless? No. No, no, no. This is a... Uh, Catholic prep school. This is a supernatural teen drama. The Craft? The Craft. Uh, like Veruca, what's her face? Oh, what is her name? I never remember her full name. Oh, um... Uh, Not Salt. <laughs> No, no, it's not Veruca. It's, it's not Veruca. Uh, it's something like that, though, right? Well, something called... Um, Feruza. Feruza. Feruza Bulk. Yeah. Bulk. Not Veruca. Not Veruca Salt, but Feruza Bulk. <laughs> Get it straight. And so. Rob, Robin Tunney, who we uh, just spoke about in Encino Man recently. So where did uh, Barbed Wire land in the rankings this week? That was uh that well, was number twelve. Okay. Number one in my heart. Yeah. No, it was, yeah. Um, With a bullet. Yeah. Uh that is our box office top ten, which means it's time to look into the character and comic book background of one Barbara Weierstein. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about Barb Wire? Well, Wikipedia, Wikipedia tells, tells me. me. That uh, Barb Wire uh, was published by Comics Greatest World, an imprint of Dark Horse Comics. Um, Comics Greatest World had it. There were uh, several titles um, with a shared universe um, centered around uh, a few fictional cities. Steel Harbor was one of them. Golden City. Arcadia and uh, Cinnabar Flats in New Mexico. Uh, it was created by Team CGW, that's Team Comics Greatest World, um, consisting of uh, John Arcudi, uh, Chris Warner, uh, I, John Arcudi wrote uh, the first eight. Uh, issues of this. So the original Barbed Wire series published nine issues between 1994 and 1995 and was followed by a four issue miniseries in 1996. A reboot was published in 2015 and lasted 
eight issues. Mm. <clears throat> this is a uh, pretty niche character. It doesn't seem like she really had the blow up that a lot of ones like Tank Girl did. Uh, uh no, not not really. Um, I I don't even remember like hearing about the character before the movie came out. Yeah. Uh, barbed, wire barbed wire stories, stories take, take place in an alternate, alternate version of present-day Earth, Earth with superhumans super and more advanced technology. technology in this Earth's history. An alien entity, entity called the Vortex arrived in 1931 and began conducting secret experiments. In 1947, an atom bomb test detonated in the desert near the aliens' experiments, resulting in a transdimensional wormhole referred to as the Vortex or the Maelstrom which released energy that gave different people across Earth superpowers for years to come. Hmm. At least there was a reason. <laughs> um, Barbara Kopetsky grew up in Steel Harbor when it was still a thriving steel industry town. Appropriate to the name. Does it where? Uh, it doesn't say where. Exactly. I always think it's because they were talking about like Denver and like Topeka. Like it's fu always funny to me, like like in DC where there's fake towns and real towns. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, I was in the Battle of Seattle. You know that. <laughs> Steel Harbor. No, she meant the Battle like, of the Bands in Seattle. Uh, 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 sounds like Detroit, Detroit to, me. to me. Or well, well Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is where a lot of yeah, steel. Okay. But there's no, but there's no port. But Philadelphia is right. port. But, but they're, they're obviously. I thought they were closer. They're closer to Canada than they are Mexico. But it also felt like the West Coast to me. Huh. Like, right. Oh my God! All the exterior, <laughs> all the exterior shots of post-apocalyptic. Post that that basically is Corpus Christi, Texas. Like all the oil fields <laughs> yes, yes. and refineries. And shit. Like yeah, that's not the future. That's now. <laughs> uh, her and Christian Slater are going on the run. <laughs> So Barbara and her brother, Charlie, <laughs> live with their grandmother and parents. Uh, the mother is a police officer and the father is a former Marine who became a steel worker. Um, following the death of her parents, Barbara leaves Steel Harbor for a time as the city's economy starts to spiral and crime begins rising. Uh, soon much of the city is controlled by warring gangs rather than the local government. When Barbara returns to Steel Harbor years later, she is now an experienced bounty hunter operating under the name Barb Wire. Uh, reuniting with Charlie, she stays in her hometown and becomes the owner of the Hammerhead Bar. To help bring in money, she continues moonlighting as a bounty hunter, working with the police directly or bail bondsman, uh, Thomas Crashell who was not Clint Howard. As time goes on, Steel Harbor is dangerous. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. From now on, whenever we're talking about any actor, I want the caveat of he's not, not Clint Howard. Howard. Not Clint yeah. Howard. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, Steel Harbor becomes a more dangerous town, a uh, city under siege from from drugs, crime, pollution, and gang warfare. In 1993, a second American Civil War begins when Golden City announces its secession from the Union. There are protests and riots in several cities. Uh, the, the riots in Steel Harbor uh, leave some neighborhoods in literal ruin, hundreds of buildings destroyed or abandoned in the area known as Metal City. Um, to help contain the chaos and keep her home from descending further, Barb Wire now acts at times as a vigilante intervening, intervening when the police can't or won't. Uh, she fights along the side of uh, the Wolf Gang. Um, <laughs> the Wolf Gang. The Wolf Gang. <laughs> Defying criminal Mace Blitzkrieg's attempts to bring all gangs under his leadership and control Mace the city. Mace Blitzkrieg. 
<laughs> May Splitskrieg, yes. May Splitskrieg. <laughs> so, growing up with a police officer mother and a Marine father, um, as well as with her life experiences outside the city, Barbed Wire is an excellent hand-to-hand -hand combatant, skilled in various firearms, and an expert driver and motorcycle rider. She's a very good driver. Her bar has been considered neutral meeting ground by the Steel Harbor gangs. Uh, aiding her bounty hunter activities is her brother, Charlie, acting as her mechanic and engineer. Um, so she has loyal allies, including Charlie. Barb Wire is a harsh, guarded person who looks at the world with suspicion and cynicism, considering herself a loner at heart. Well, it was um, 2017. So. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was it's a rough year. Um, it was. <laughs> we we thought we were going to descend into madness. Yeah, I, yeah. All right, thank you, Al. That brings us to the film production itself. Um, this movie was written by uh, Chuck Farr and Eileen Chaikin. By two people. Yes. Um, Chuck Farr, uh, his, uh, wrote, mostly wrote, uh, like, a, so a sudden impact, Navy SEALs, hard target, that kind of stuff. But he also has some credits on Dark Man, um, Arlington Road, Red Planet. Um, some of those movies are decent movies. And he had a, uh, Writing credit on the Green Hornet, the the Seth uh, uh, Rogan. Rogan. I'm a yeah, that one that we uh, talked about a year or so back. Um, his uh, co-credited writer Eileen Chaikin. Um, prior to this mostly wrote for TV. She did a lot of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, she had, uh, oh, that, she has a uh, producing credit on that movie Satisfaction, the Justine Bateman vehicle, where she was in a girl band. Uh, I haven't seen that since like 1988. I wonder, that, that'd be an interesting one to check out again. Um, these days, she mostly is working on Law & Order, Order organized crime, a spinoff which I only now learned existed. Yeah, brought Chris Maloney back. Mm. He was he wasn't going to, but they're like, "We'll give you your own." And it's so disappointing because who cares about organized crime? Yeah, nobody. That's who. Um, it was directed by David Hogan. I only care about disorganized crime. Exactly. Uh, Which was a great movie. It really was. Check it, out. Yeah. Such a great movie. Uh, David Hogan was the director. He mostly directed music videos. Um, ah, you can tell. Yeah. Uh, he did uh, Ronnie Millsaps, She Loves My Car. A ton, t like throughout the 80s and 90s, so many. Uh, Toto, The Judds, Diana Ross, Eddie Murphy, Procol Harum. Um, huh. Prince. There's totally music video inspired you know like all the time she like skids out on her motorcycle oh, and seductively so takes her helmet off so much like, it's either a hair commercial or a music video so this, he's flipping her hair after she takes her like, this dude directed off. the you got the look video for prince um he did he worked with oh he did he did in the ghetto eric b and rakim <laughs> um coolest elvis sample ever hell yeah um, oh, he did the uh, All I Want to Do is Have Some Fun video for Sheryl Crow. Like, um, you know. Oh, he did the Hook video, Blues Traveler. So, yeah. Oh, big, big, movie. big music video guy. He was the second unit director on Batman Forever. Mm. Um, that also, that makes, also makes a ton, a ton of sense, sense as to why you yep. got this gig, but also yeah. why this movie looks like this. Yeah, absolutely. And most, most of this movie, movie looks second unit. unit. You know what I mean? Just, yes. You know, pe people in helmet with helmets on, you can't identify them. They're all, you know. Oh my God! Yeah. Um, this is his only feature directing uh, job. So um, after this, he kind of went back to music videos. 
did a lot of like music, did a lot of uh, music uh, documentary stuff too in the 2000s. So um, seems oh, seems music. to be associated a lot with uh, the Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> so I wonder uh, if Tommy Lee knew. Him. <laughs> oh, with the Dave Matthews. <laughs> you mean <laughs> Dave? Yeah. And that really the nice DMB. man who plays violin. That's, That's all I know. know. Yeah. Uh, the drummer for Dave Matthews Band's kit looks like an episode of Hoarders. <laughs> one, of my, <laughs> one of my favorite lines from uh, yeah another podcast. Anyways, uh, Barb Wire stars Pamela Anderson Lee as Barbara Barb Wire Kapetsky. <laughs> um, Pam Anderson, of course, got her start as a model. She's Canadian. She was discovered oh. at a Canadian football league game. Yep. Where she was featured on a jumbotron while wearing a Labatt's t-shirt. Which that might be the most Canadian thing I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. to be discovered. I mean, it had to be at a hockey game for it to be the most Canadian thing ever. Yeah. Labatt <laughs> saw that and hired her to be their spokesmodel. And then Hugh noticed her, right? Yeah. Hugh Hefner. Hefner. Well, yeah. Um, was, was she, she an, an adult, adult at that point? point? Yes. Okay, okay, at least that's good. Yeah, she was She was uh, 19 years old. Oh, okay. okay. Um, well, she then, yeah, appeared. Um, in, she was a cover girl on Playboy in for October 89. Um, and then she moved to L.A. to further pursue her modeling career. Um, she was Playmate of the Month for February 1990. Um, then she got hired on Home Improvement, where recently, in her, a recent uh, uh, biography, she said that uh, she was uh, regularly sexually harassed by someone on that store, uh, show who was not Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> yeah. Um, it wasn't Al Borland? Because, I mean, that guy's a total scumbag. That, he's such a horn dog. <laughs> Don't ever talk about car. Yeah. Corn talk with the car. No, it's someone who may or may not have uh, narked on his friends to stay out of jail for smuggling coke. He may or may he, not he have been Santa Claus for a decade or two. Yeah. Who was it? Was it Jimmy Kimmel? It definitely wasn't Fallon because he's such a pussy. But recently he was on a talk show and the host was trying to bring up his... Um, Years in prison for trafficking cocaine. Uh, <laughs> and he kept trying to deflect. It was great. Oh, well, yeah. Um, she would go on to uh, star as C.J. Parker on Baywatch. Um, she, uh, let's see. In 94, uh, she got her first film starring role in a movie called Raw Justice. <laughs> Raw Justice. <laughs> starring. Yeah, she, make, make sure you, you cook, cook it in. And- Clean it before you eat it. Yeah, <laughs> you shouldn't eat like rice. Wear a condom yeah. for justice. She starred alongside Stacy Keach and David Keith. Stacy Keach starts today. I always, I always forget, forget that there is a David Keith <laughs> out there because I'm always just like, wait, you mean Keith David, right? No, we love David uh, Keith. Love yeah, yeah, they they live amongst other things. Well, because that's Keith David. Oh, that's, that's Keith, Keith David. That's Keith, Keith David. David. David Keith, Keith is a is white, white guy. Oh, I don't remember <laughs> David Keith. And if I, 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 I recognize him, if you saw, saw his face, you'd be like, oh, that's David Keith. Keith. But I, I yeah, I just always think people mean Keith David. Yeah, right. yeah. that's what I think of. Yeah, no, but there is also a David Keith. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. He's much um, cheaper to hire, I'm sure. <laughs> we're, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll gloss over the sex tape thing. Everyone knows about that and... It's, you know, you know, fuck people for, you know, it was her private shit. Fuck everybody. With her husband. Yeah. Is what, I mean, her there, husband, there was nothing, nothing, nothing tawdry about it. Nothing. Yeah. It's just a husband and wife having fun. Yeah, American, American culture and our, and our approach to sexuality is so fucking exploitative. It's disgusting. Uh, yeah. And puritanical. We've yeah. never... Sh- we're yeah. so debaucherous, and yet at the same time, have never given up that puritanical like. You made a video. You're disgusting. Yeah, I may have watched it, but I may have watched it, but you're the gross one. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, obviously, uh, 
who, oh, she was Invisible Girl in superhero movie. So technically, this is the second movie we've covered with her. That's amazing. Because she, she never appeared on screen. We must have talked about it at the time, but I don't remember. Wait, Wait was, was she, she actually, actually at all involved with superhero movie? movie? Or, or did, did they, they just put, put her name in the credits and say that she was the Invisible Girl? No, no, girl? She, she's on the poster. Really? Yeah, so she must have. She was I have like, like deep six that movie. Yeah, no, I remember very little about it. But they were popular. I mean, it started with the scary movies, obviously. But yeah. they, they were popular teen movies. For their I, I remember superhero. She, she probably was involved. I remember superhero movie not being as bad as we were expecting it to be. I kept. I keep mixing it up with the other one that is the worst one that we've ever done. Oh, that thing. The religious one? That one. Oh. Oh, my God. That Fuck well, that snuck, movie. Snuck Jesus Super. Or... What was that called? Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm glad that she was in superhero movie and not that one. Um, bringing back uh, Encino Man, soon to be on Patreon.com slash Harmless Entertainment. Um, we talked about this movie a little bit there. Polly Shore is dead. She appeared in the huh. uh, the mockumentary Polly Shore made about himself in 2003. <laughs> Because he, he was, was a, a Playboy, Playboy Mansion, Mansion regular, regular, you know. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. He was always at the party. No, no stories of him being weird or creepy, but, you know. Yeah. We, we talked, talked about him. He's Hollywood royalty. Makes, makes sense. sense. He's a fixture, yeah. Right. right. Young, Young single, single guy on MTV. I would. I would. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first, her first TV appearance was on an episode of Charles in Charge. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Has anybody wonder, heard the headlines recently about Scott Baio? Not recently. He, said he feels that California is no longer safe, so he's moving his family to, guess it, Texas, Florida. 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 <laughs> he feels that California no longer knows how to party. I guess. Chachi is afraid of California. Oh, my God. Um, wow. He, he should watch out for Florida, man. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, Everybody should, should. watch well, your back. Stay, stay in Florida, Florida long enough, enough, and you become a Florida man yourself. So, well, yeah, it's he'll, he'll, he'll be in the paper soon enough. Unless, Unless you're older you're than 75 or so, or so. Yeah, yeah, you just, you just become, become a Florida, Florida man. man. Yeah. Ugh. All right. So, um, Tamara Morrison as Axel Hood. My man he's really tomorrow. bringing it. I mean, you could tell. We already know he's an actor, but he's not just like, I'm going to do my best. He's acting. I don't know. He's doing work. He's, he's, he's New Zealand's greatest actor. Him yeah. and uh, what's her name? Uh, Renee Owen? Or Ren- Rena Owen? Yeah. The two of them are just the best thing to come out of New Zealand. He always should have worked more, and he should be working more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've, Sorry, Sam, Sam Neil. <laughs> we've uh, talked about him a number of times, both on the uh, Patreon where we did the Star Wars movies. Um, that's uh, haven't listened. That's, that's that's been a minute, so I'm not sure what those sound like at this point. But uh, that was a few years ago. But uh, we'll never know. Yeah, I'm not going to go back and listen to him. Most recently, we talked about him in. Uh, he was in. He played Tom Curry in Aquaman. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, we will be talking about him again because he reprises that role twice this year in The Flash and Aquaman The Lost Kingdom. Oh, wait, that's still coming out? Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, one of the greatest dramatic movies I've ever seen, Once Were Warriors. He plays Jake Us oh, with Rena, Rena Owen. And it, yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, such an incredibly really good movie. movie. Um, um, uh, speaking of the Aquaman, I just read that like Jason Momoa, one of his conditions is that he wants climate change to be one of the villains. I can dig that, I guess. But it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, like, but like it should be a pass. It should be a concept in it. Yeah, not, like, theme. I'm gonna battle. <laughs> I I hope he punches rising sea levels. Right in the face. <laughs> I'm gonna rebuild this glacier right now. Uh, uh, Victoria, Victoria Rowell as uh, Cora D, Dr. Karina Devonshire. Is she from <laughs> some things? She was super familiar looking. Um, her first that character was 
Her her music. her first role was in Leonard Part Six with Bill Cosby. <laughs> oh my God! Wow. Yeah, yeah I, yeah. I, I, watched, I watched, like I said, I watched, I watched the behind the scenes, scenes things just briefly, and they were like, like and, and the actress that plays Karen Karen B, she's in this. And I was like, should I know her from something? Uh, yeah, so the distinguished gentleman, Dumb and Dumber. Eve's Bayou. She's she she's worked. the goon in Dumb and Dumber. No, she's the FBI oh, agent. Um, oh, she's uh, the FBI agent. Yeah. Who is the chick? Duffy, Duffy, Karen Duffy, Duffy from MTV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> so the one that we actually see and the one that talks, right? Because she had facial. Uh, she changed her entire face. Reconstruction. So, reconstruction. Yeah. So there were photos of the other one. I, yeah. I'm this, sure the one that played the character. This is one of my uh, did not age well moments in this movie. Why are we lightening the skin of the one black character we don't see on screen? Yeah. yeah. And then to cap it off, give her blue eyes at the end. But I, well, I was going to say, especially because in this future, everyone's recognized through retinal scans. So changing yeah. your appearance as we no, <laughs> in the movie, <laughs> doesn't help. I don't know. Oh no, she's my big. That character is my biggest on the answer question. She she was a regular in the Cosby Show. She played Paula and was in episodes Cliff's Wet Adventure. Oh, with Paula. Yeah, um, um, that's probably why they had this familiarity when they were introducing her on the thing. Because I was like, I don't. I feel like they're saying she's a household name. It seemed weird, but well, she she was she, she was she was she was in uh, she was in two episodes of the Cosby Show, uh, one episode of Fresh Prince, uh, one episode of Herman's Head. Uh, uh, she was in the Boys to Men on Bended Knee, ah, uh, music video. That was all prior to Dumb and Dumber, so she was just kind of like around. She was she was a working actress, but um. She uh, in in early '90s, you know, black TV. That was there was kind of a weird um, segregation at the time with, you know, uh, cast. But um, she, let's see, she was she was on The Young and the Restless, playing Drusilla Barber Winters from 1990 to 2000, and Drusilla. Drusilla, and wow. from 2002 to 2007, two oh, non-consecutive she, times. Because she, she died, died and then came back to life. <laughs> like, yeah, probably. I imagine. Yeah. Um, and from from 2013 to the present, she's been playing Kitty Berenger on the Rith- Rich and the Ruthless, which is a web, <laughs> which is a web soap opera uh, parody show. <laughs> Well, because you, you start out young and restless, but then as you grow up, you become rich and ruthless. Yeah, exactly. After puberty. Yeah. Jack, this is the best name ever. Jack Noseworthy. Uh, Noseworthy. We've seen him once already this week. As Charlie Kopetsky. He was an Encino man. Yep. He's baby boy he, from uh, Event Horizon. Yeah. Yeah. He reminds me of James LaGrosse. I don't know if you guys... I remember that guy, I but... vaguely do. I, you know what I always remember this dude from is the Brady Bunch movie. <laughs> because he because his line, his line, her pants are harder to get into than a Pearl Jam concert. <laughs> Which is hilarious yeah, for a, a movie about how like past pop culture stuff doesn't age well. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, this dude, he's, uh, yeah, I don't know. He just, he's kept working. He's in a bunch of stuff. Um, he did a good job in this. Yeah. Yeah. Again, he, he was acting. Yeah. He was totally fine. Uh, Xander Berkeley played, uh, chief Alexander Willis. Um, so uh, this dude was like, like a character actor guy. Uh, his let's see, he started early in the early '80s. He was in uh, episodes of Mash and The Incredible Hulk, Remington Steel. He was Which in. Which guy the, are we, Is this the, the cop? Bad guy. The cop. 
No, no, the oh. Claude Rains. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Willis, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Claude Rains is who we're talking about here. Um, That's his name? No. The, the <laughs> character. Like... He played the Claude Rains character. Okay. Because know. this is a thinly veiled remake of Casablanca. Nice. Um, he was in Mommy Dearest. That's his first film role. What? Uh, this, this is, is a thinly, thinly veiled remake of Casablanca? Yeah, you didn't catch that? It's the exact I plot just... to Casablanca. No, it's not the exact plot. But, but I mean, the essentially. End, the, end, the, end, the ending and everything, though. It's the, uh, the yeah, in the rain. Yeah, yeah, that. No, no, she, she runs a bar. She runs a bar. Yeah. Um, they, they come with like, uh, there's, there's the MacGuffin they come with that they're trying to, that her old flame oh, comes with it's where the, the Nazis show up. Beast. It's, it's a remake of Casablanca. Absolutely. Sure. Plot point by plot point. Obviously a lot changes in the like specifics cause it's, you know, barbed wire, but it's 100% Casablanca. That was why my opening thing was about of all the gin joints in all the world. Yeah, no, I, Okay, cool. Um, I mean, the, the end at the airport, I absolutely thought that. But then in my brain, I was like, how lame, you know, that they tried to do that. No, the yeah, yeah the entire movie right. follows the plot of Ca Casablanca. Ugh. Yeah, sorry, yeah. start on. to finish. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, that, I didn't. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this dude works a lot. Oh, Fabulous Baker Boys. That's a movie I haven't seen in a minute. Uh, the Grifters. Oh, he was in Terminator 2. This dude really works, the the cop. Um, he, uh, most, he's in this year in a movie. Oh, my God. In this year, he's in a Reagan biopic in which Dennis Quaid stars as Ronald Reagan. Gross. Also in this year, he was in an episode of The Mandalorian. Who was he in The Mandalorian? Uh, Let's see. He Galad Palayan. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know who that was, but Tamora Morrison also in The Mandalorian as Boba Fett. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I, I believe he's, he's playing a... Uh, a um, uh, imperial or not an imperial I guess he'd be a, an imperial remnant officer I that think that would make sense yeah he was in uh, I think he was in that uh, circle I don't know anyone who hasn't watched this season of the Mandalorian the circle of bad guys I, I probably <laughs> wasn't thinking of Casablanca because I was thinking of Star Wars with their stupid scroll in the beginning and with the um, like the resistance and the, I don't think and they said yeah. republic, some kind of republic doesn't, Doesn't Casablanca, Casablanca open with a scroll, though? It's a card. It's like it's like doesn't scroll, but there is a card up yeah. that explains things. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just, just like that's, that's where, where I went in my brain. brain. Yeah, because you know rebels and resistance, rebels and republic. But yeah, like and like that. Yeah, I mean it was. It, I oh, mean, you're it was right. Very I see it now. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's face it. Star Wars was, was just a remake of Casablanca. That's true. I mean, <laughs> yep. Star Wars. A, yeah, Star Wars was kind of a remake of several things simultaneously. Somehow. <laughs> um, uh, oh God, I don't want to go through all these people. Udo Kier as Curly. Yeah, I don't I even do remember like who the fuck Udo that was. Kier. Yeah, so Curly is the bald, and, and then hair. Yeah, her her oh, Alfred Pennyworth. Pennyworth. Her Alfred yeah. character. Her 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 dance club butler. Yeah. yeah. I, he, I also, I also have, have a, a singular, singular question, question about it. Yeah. He is a great German character actor. Yes, this he dude. He appeared a lot in the 80s and 90s. Okay. And then recently in a couple, a couple pretty cool uh, horror movies. Don't Breathe, I believe. I was so called. confused by the hair. <laughs> of why there was, then wasn't. Well, where does it go? That's, That's my question. question. Is, is he putting he it in his pocket? pocket? Is, is it just a continuity, continuity error? The hair? He what has hair. hair. There's and one he's wearing a wig. Hair. It's a she wig. She rips the wig off of him, and she but says like, it looks stupid. But like, yeah. just randomly wearing a wig. There's no like character. Like, there's no like. Oh, I miss my hair. Like, I was so confused why the hair was like a he wasn't, thing. But he wasn't right, wearing it earlier either. either. Yeah. He just yeah. was yeah. wearing it in that yeah. one moment. No, he was, he was workshopping a look. look. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we didn't know how. Because because his name was Curly, and he just wanted curls. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she she wouldn't let him be who he Steve wanted to be. Rails Meanwhile, back. she's wearing extensions. <laughs> yeah, Steve Rails back played uh, Colonel Victor Prizer. Um. Oh, uh, those, those guys. Yeah, the Nazis. Um. Yeah, I love how no matter what, the first thing an evil organization does is make outfits. That yeah. look exactly yeah. like that. <laughs> well, right, yeah. yeah. Other fascist get-ups. Yeah. Yeah. And raincoats. Everybody needs a raincoat. Yeah. Um, Medals that mean nothing. This, <laughs> this actor, the guy who played the head Nazi goon, mm. um, on, on the behind the scenes, so they're, they're interspersing shots of, you know, like, here's them on set, here's a short interview with Pam Anderson, whatever, whatever. But everything is this guy explaining the world building and the plot behind the movie. Wow. He is... 100 percent invested in this film being made and it was fascinating to see him like yeah you know it's interesting the first thing that a civilization does when it collapses like he is thinking about all of the like nuance behind his very 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 Holy on the nose nazi character so, so this guy's been working for years and years uh his first role was in 1972 in 1976 he played Charles Manson in the Helter Skelter miniseries. Oh, wow. He, he looks, looks the part. part. Yeah. I bet he did. Yeah. Um, yeah. His his most well-known roles are The Stuntman from 1980 and Life Force from 1985. I think I may have seen that when I was a kid. but I, I remember Stuntman. That was a fun movie. Was that the one with, like, the big, big, big fall from, like, the... The, that really tall building it's like a famous yeah. shot i'm thinking of like i don't yeah, yeah. I, believe I believe you're correct, correct. yeah, yeah. Was, they, they broke, broke a few, few records, records with stunts in that movie mm. um i don't know there's a ton of people in this clint howard of course as schmitz Ooh. i'm sorry they just have a recent picture of clint howard on wikipedia no wow Jeez. he aged about how you think clint howard would age he got the short end of the Howard stick, and it was a pretty small stick. I told, I told Jude, that's Ron Howard's brother. And never forget that Ron Howard is the one that got the looks in that family. Oh, yeah, he's the handsome one. What if Bryce Dallas had gotten her Uncle Glenn's teeth? Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, um... Yeah, Clint Howard. I mean, it's Clint Howard. He's been in so, so, so many things. Um, yeah, he's great. We love him. Yeah, he's Clint Howard. Um, that's that's the. Yeah, I don't want to go into everybody else. On oh, well, I will mention Andre Rosie Brown has big fat. So which? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, um, that dude. Uh, he played the big fat guy in show after show after movie designing women caddyshack 2 throw mama from the train night court golden girls canadian bacon fresh prince dude worked if they needed a big fat black dude they called him (laughs) and he came to set the front loader and was ready to work um this movie's soundtrack was one of those classic was made yeah it was one of those classic 90s, like, they tried to position it as one of those kind of classic 90s soundtracks that everyone needed. But unfortunately, it contained music such as Tommy Lee's Planet Boom. Oh, my God. The lyrics to that, Jim. Michael, well, there's like six Die Cheerleader songs on this album, too, right? Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, they were the yeah. house band. Yeah. 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 Um, Michael Hutchins's version of Spill the Wine. Oh, Gunn's version of Word Up. Hagfish doing Hot Child in the City. I see. I see the theme here. Yeah. Doing old 70s funk stuff with it was like alternative. That, uh, like The Judgment Night soundtrack was like that? Yeah, but well, Judgment Night was fucking amazing. No, I know, I know but covers. covers. Yeah. Well, not. I mean, not just covers, but like also, like, but it was, it was teaming up Rack rap acts with rock acts too that was yes it was yeah. that's right um this does have salt and peppa doing none of your business the barbed wire metal mix <laughs> oh, no. oh my god um yeah this I've got some meat puppets in there there, the, there were some meat puppets yes 
Um, not just Pamela Anderson. Sorry. Gibby Hayes passed uh, away. Barb Wire has 28% on Rotten Tomatoes. And next it movie is Barb. was reviewed by Siskel and Ebert. Okay, oh, I say I say two down. Absolutely, fucking two down. But I know it's happening. I hope not. Yeah. Our next movie is Barb Wire, starring Pamela Anderson Lee from Baywatch, another big screen starring debut here in a major role as the owner of a bar in the last free city in America after congressional right wingers have staged a second civil war in the year 2017. She's a freelance mercenary and bounty hunter who, among various guises, poses as a hooker to get inside information and to get her man. But most of her time is spent in the bar she runs, where in this scene, visiting congressionals or government stormtroopers makes a threat. Now tell me what movie this reminds you of. Rumor has it that you used to fight with the resistance. You shouldn't believe everything you hear. I'm neutral. I'm a businesswoman, Colonel. Perhaps we can do business. I can assure you, Barb has a very keen sense of commerce. If you answered that the scene reminded you of Casablanca, you answered correctly. In fact, the last two-thirds of Barbed Wire is inspired so closely by Casablanca that you can have fun identifying the scenes and the characters. Here, for example, is a scene where Barb runs into an old lover named Axel only to discover that he is now married to a courageous freedom fighter. When I learned that Topeka, Kansas was a lab experiment and that the Congressionals planned to unleash Red Ribbon on the entire free territories, I defected to the resistance. It was Axel that helped me get out of Washington. Initially, we married on paper purely for identification purposes. We've been on the run ever since. How utterly damn heroic. Barbed wire has possession of priceless contact lenses that can alter a person's identity, allowing them free passage to Canada. And, of course, she gives them to the heroic resistance fighters and helps them get to the airport. So the Paul Bear rips off The Graduate and Barbed Wire rips off Casablanca. And I didn't mind that Barbed Wire recycled so much of its plot from Casablanca because bad movies are remade so often these days that it's refreshing to see them remaking a good one for a change, ripping off a classic. But the movie never delivers on the underlying human tensions in Casablanca and is more concerned with special effects and violence and how many different ways Pam Anderson's Brazier can be photographed. Barbed Wire is not a good movie, but it's not a boring one. And in the annals of trash classics, I think it's eventually going to rank pretty high. Not, not with me. Um, I just, uh, I'm amazed uh, with the Casablanca comparison. I'm just thinking about what Ingrid Bergman would look like in you know, Frederick's of Hollywood clothing, because that's really the attraction here, I suppose, to see Pamela Anderson, see whether her breasts are going to top a lot of her uh, cat lady outfit or whatever she's wearing. I mean, there isn't a whole lot more than that here, Roger. Um, I, I, I There's a high energy level. level. They work very hard in this movie. They have a lot, they have of, a lot of stunts, Roger. Well, yes, they do. <laughs> I said they have a lot of stunts. I found none of them entertaining. Not a single one. What about the atmosphere? What about the uh, Sydney Green Street character who runs a junk yard and sits around in the I scoop? Didn't find, I didn't find him interesting. I think that, no, I, I'm As telling you. As a movie fan, though, didn't you even get off on any of the cross references and so forth? I, I, I understand what you're talking about. But uh, I was basically had her being thrust yeah, well, in my face. Yeah, you know, I demand two things of a movie. This one only gave me one. It's not a good movie. Okay, but it didn't bore me. So that's, right. it did bore me. Okay. Um, Roger right. and... Uh, They're just going to leave us hanging without their thumbs? Gene. I'm going one up, one down. Oh, it was definitely one up, one down, I think. Yeah. 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 Roger was a hard read. Yeah. That was a... Uh, huh. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting take. I was not. I did not foresee Roger coming out for it in any way whatsoever. Man likes uh, boobs. Yeah, <laughs> and Gene is trying to. Yeah, he does. He's trying to imagine Ingrid Bergman in dress. You know, what? I was imagining Humphrey Bogart I, like that. I I was immediately <laughs> able to envision Ingrid Bern, Bergman in that uh, jumpsuit thing. So. <laughs> That's what bummed him out. He could, yeah, picture he, that. He needs to work on his imagination. Mine is very oh old. so much. He has no imagination. No, no, none whatsoever. Um, and now I'm thinking about Humphrey Bogart dressed in that same thing. So you know, <laughs> yeah, Humphrey Bogart with the 17 inch waist from a corset <laughs> and six inch pumps. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. Sometimes Pamela Anderson running in those pumps and corset. I was like, oh my god, let the woman sit down. She, she is, is working, working so, so fucking hard. hard. Yeah. Um, I I have one letterbox review. 
which says uh, from uh, A Pink's writes, Barbara says, the year was 2017, the worst year of my life. Me. OMG, twin, you get it. <sighs> oh, just wait. Just wait. It gets better. 2017. <sighs> Uh, so that's about it for the background. Guys, you ready to jump into the movie? Yes. Allow, Allow me to slip, slip into, into something, something a little more comfortable. A little less comfortable. And, and get my paddle. My Let me slip into something a little more comfortable. And she puts on a corset. I don't think you understand what comfort means. <laughs> All right. Mine bunches up. That's for sure. <laughs> Here we go. This is Barb Wire. We open on a scroll. In 2017, during the Second American Civil War, Steel Harbor is the last free city in a United States ravaged by war. Then we get a three-minute credit sequence of Pamela Anderson getting hosed down with her tits out. <laughs> yeah, in the titles. Yeah. In the titles. Three minutes of her getting nose down. She's not even Clark Kent. I, I see, see nothing, nothing wrong. Give, give the people, people what they, they want, want right up front, up front and, and then give, give them a movie. Because if they had ended this movie with this, this it would have been, been way worse. Well, yeah. But this you, is very titillating from, from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It is. Uh, she plays a stripper who... Kills a guy with a high heel. This essentially goes unremarked on by the clientele. Uh, she actually didn't, didn't kill that, that guy. guy. He, he was, was still, still breathing, breathing when they they, oh. they drug him out. Okay. Uh, I mean, she did, she did partially, partially pierce his skull with, with the high heel, heel but uh, uh, but he's still alive. He's just very badly damaged. Also, I. F- so also okay so she's undercover as a stripper and she decides that she's gonna go with a wet theme and gets a guy to haul a garden hose into the strip club and just start spraying everywhere (laughs) and that's a leather dress that's you're not using that for your performance tomorrow then again there's no performance tomorrow but like a leather dress and a fire hose as bold move as somebody who worked at a strip club at one point in my life you do not want to be spraying hoses of water around in that place. That's, that's well, there are lots hazard. of lots, lots of lights and there's a stuff lot of electronics. And, exactly, and yeah. literally between every song, a dude would jump, a bouncer would jump up and wipe down the stage because it's slippery and dangerous. Slippery. Yeah. yeah, walking yeah. around in high heels is a dangerous. Everything, everything is, is wet, wet in this. Future. Yeah, everything. Everything. Everything, Every, everything except Pamela. Um, uh, unlike, unlike Tank Girl, Girl, where everything, everything is dry. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you can have a future. This is our. This is our 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 dystopian future with water. Tank Girl's our dystopian future without water. This, this is, is somewhere between, between Tank Girl and Waterworld. Water yep. Yeah. Just water <laughs> seeping down walls. And such. Yeah. Um. So uh, she rescues a young schoolgirl being held hostage in a meat locker at the back of the club. Why does so, a strip club have a full kitchen and meat locker? Well, and that was like to a make high, their yeah. burgers. It was like it was a high-end restaurant, restaurant that had a strip club as its central fixture. I guess because it was like it was like a fancy dining room and everything. My question is: Are there still private schools? Why is the schoolgirl dressed like she's in a Catholic school? I guess. Yeah, if I don't know what was, yeah, I don't know what was held over pre-Civil War and what wasn't. It's very right. Well, I'm very confused because then they talk about the neutral zone or whatever at the end. Yeah. And I thought Steel City was the neutral zone, but apparently only the airport is. Like, I'm so confused. Yeah. So confused. Uh, the unoccupied zone. There you go. Uh, but, but maybe, maybe she, she was, was dressed up as a schoolgirl for a fantasy. fantasy. Yeah, but she was a child. Her parents were like rescuing her. Yeah. Yeah, I think that it was very much like she had just been kidnapped and she had not been processed or whatever. I don't know how those things were. She kind of looked like a child when when we first saw her, but then 
in the impending scenes, she looks like five years old. Well, I'm sure she was played by a 20 year old, but I, I was, was under. Say, yeah, no, no one wanted to bring a minor to the set for this movie. Yeah, I'm sure she was played by a 20 year old, but I don't think she was. I felt like she was supposed to be a teenager in, in, in the yeah. world of the film. Right. Yeah, it felt like she was a rescuer from a trafficking. But then it seemed like she trafficked her herself. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, wait, wait is, is she, she doing, doing the, the old scam where you commit the crime and then you offer the solution immediately afterwards? <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's, yeah. Bars uh, are expensive, expensive to keep open, open so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah she, she has, has to, to moonlight to keep her, obviously, bar. That club. <laughs> yeah. A bar that is that, okay, well, I'll get to that. Anyway, so um, she returns the kid to her rich parents for money because she's barbed wire. The famous bounty hunter slash mercenary. But they only have half, so she takes their car, too. Yeah. And then she heads back to the club she owned, called the Hammerhood, where there's a DJ and live band simultaneously. Yeah. I, yeah, I just want to comment on the, the, the family saying, oh, sorry, we only have half. That's such a consistent theme for this movie, and I'm so glad that it is. And which is, it's, it's such like a, a thin thing, but like women having to negotiate for higher pay fucking constantly because men can just offer them less money is a theme in this movie. And I wonder if that was the writers or if that was like Pam being like, no, this, can you have them rip me off and have me negotiate? Now, this is also pay? a scene from Casablanca where they are trying to get passage through Rick and they don't have enough money, but it was a fit, it was just a family looking for passage out in Casablanca. Every scene is just a scene from Casablanca. <laughs> well, not every scene. So they, they, yeah, yeah, not every. They, uh, they offer her crypto instead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So her, her club with a DJ and a live band simultaneously, and the DJ has a headset and a microphone. I'm so confused <laughs> about what that guy's doing. It, it, DJing Everything isn't like it used to be, Thoreau. In the future, <laughs> you do it all. <laughs> He's, He's podcasting, podcasting at the same, same time. time. <laughs> He's also an air traffic controller. <laughs> and the, uh, the operator. Yeah. Everyone, Everyone that, that works in the bar is moonlighting to keep it open. open. Yeah. Even though he was wildly, wildly packed bar at all times. At all times. And before I realized she was a bounty hunter, I thought she was moonlighting as a hooker. And I'm just like... You know, no, bars, bars can, can fail, fail, but Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got a hook just to keep this bar open. Um, so, yeah, uh, we cut to Colonel Victor Prizer using his patented torture bikini. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what if it, he has to torture a dude? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you, just, you just cut his penis off before you put that thing on him. Yep, tuck it dude, back. Dude's have nipples, too. Why was why was the equipment just hooked to the boobs and vagina? But he was just doing brain stuff. It was I was gonna say, why wasn't the one clamped to her face enough? Yeah. Why? Like, what are her what are her tits thinking? What's what's her cooch Boom thinking? Memory. We yeah. all we all think with our sexual organs. It's true, but do we? Is that where we store our memories? I mean, this yes. movie was written, directed, and filmed That's what by all seconds. By a penis, so yeah. that makes sense. No, An no, erect by, penis. A, no, no, it was written by, and we've talked about this team before, the two 13-year-olds uh, on cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> Those dudes are responsible for a lot of movies. Yeah. Case, case of Red Bull and a puppy and a notepad. Write us a movie, kids. Yeah. Fantastic. Be like, what if we saw her boobs? You're a genius. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll, that'll work. work. And then they forgot for the rest of the movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, uh, they're looking for Cora D, Dr. Karina Devonshire. Okay, because her body holds an antidote No, to something we don't know yet. But didn't they say something like that? She has developed it. She's the scientist oh. behind the antidote. Oh, I thought, I thought she, she was, was like, like it was a situation, situation where she's the only one that's immune. Yeah, no, no, it's not all. Yeah, not a Last of Us situation. She, she helped, helped develop, develop the original, original strain virus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Which we'll I have so, so many fucking, fucking questions about. God. Yeah. Man. Topeka was. <laughs> Topeka is an experiment. <laughs> I mean, I can't deny that, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yes. Uh, so, Prizer gets sent by Congress to go find her because they figure out she's in Steel City. <laughs> by Congress. They're still a Congress. They're the they're the fascist they like just council. Like that. They became yeah, no, congressional, ca- like congressionals. That's, that's what, what they, they called them. them. Yeah, it's uh, an interesting, interesting perspective, perspective on uh, falling, falling into fascism. fascism. It that is. We would do it. Well, that we would, we would do, do it as a democracy, democracy and not as a republic. Well, I was going to say, yeah, like true fascism. That's one of the first things they do is dismantle the current government. Like, yeah. No, we're not. We're not voting anymore. You don't have representation, <laughs> but not in this. They just wanted scary outfits. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, back at the club, we meet Barb's club butler and her blind brother. Then Barb heads out. So is I'm sorry. So is he the Peter Laurie character? Um, the, the no, no, the Peter. I'm sorry, Claude Rain. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, no, no. Peter Laurie character would be um um would be a uh uh uh. uh, uh Willis Howard, uh, Howard. Clint Howard. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, he reminded me of her Alfred the Pennyworth. Like, mm. I want you to stop doing this. He's Sam. You do it. He's Sam, right? I, okay, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Works it helps run the club. Yeah. Um, I at first I thought the DJ was going to be Sam, but he didn't really do anything. <laughs> Yeah, the, yo, DJ, play it again. <laughs> yeah, Tremor Morrison's like, play it for me, Sam. Play the song I want to hear. <laughs> what up, everybody say? No, so he plays that what, Viva La France or whatever the song is that they yeah. all get up and sing. To yeah, the <laughs> yeah. But he has it on vinyl. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, Barb heads out and tricks a perfectly harmless, sweaty, submissive businessman into letting her into his apartment where she finds a guy named Krebs who's got some special eyes and (laughs) he's got 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 Betty Davis Davis eyes. Yeah. She gives him to Clint Howard, who's a bail bondsman. Um, Uh, why did the henchman look? look Go ahead. Oh, how how did she know that this dude was right next to have an apartment right next to the dude she was actually looking for? <laughs> it's a fair question. That, yeah. Um, and, yeah. And also, so oh. prostitution's legal here, but at the same time, she's still hanging out in a doorway trying to, like, right. get, get Johns. Well, that's how you... Let them know you're a prostitute. <laughs> you hang right. out in a doorway. <laughs> you gotta sit in the door. <laughs> Down on the dead giveaway. Yeah. Why did all the henchmen look like 1930s gangsters? Why did they all look like they were from Dick Tracy? And it's retro. <laughs> yeah, that 2000s. <laughs> That's when swing dance took things to a way. And why did that last henchman, um, who had just moments before been sh- exchanging gunfire with her just walk out and be like oh that was pretty impressive and then she just kills him because like that's you can't just get in a gunfight with someone then at the end be like hey that was some good work let's shake hands hey, good job yeah good job. yeah it's like an old timey duel yeah um so yeah she gives him to clint howard then head back to the club that gets raided by our claude rains character the chief of police who pays who she pays off to leave her alone. He was shocked there was gambling in this establishment. Um, the next night, Prizer and the Nazis show up at the club to terrorize everybody while looking for Cora D, who's, <laughs> who I believe shared a bill for a while with Kid and Play. Yeah, I think so. They went on tour. Yeah. Um, the Cora D does turn up at the Hammerhead along with Axel Hood. It was a freedom fighter that Barb uh, had a prior relationship at the beginning of the war. They were in the Battle of Seattle, which, Seattle, which, Seattle. We, see, which we see later on. Looks a, well, For some reason, they're using Vietnam-era uniforms and helicopters at the Battle of Seattle. 
<laughs> Pamela Anderson. It looked so like lovely. it looked like the flashbacks from Airplane. Yeah, yeah. it did. Totally. Um. Yeah. They were separated during the conflict. Uh, Axel wants to get Cora <laughs> to Canada. Canada. So much is about Canada. <laughs> Canada plays a really big role in this film. Oh, Just yeah, the she, concept of Canada. She only, only wants, wants her money, money in Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. Which is hilarious every time. Yeah. <laughs> Canadian. Uh, oh, yeah. Canadian. Um, so, because they have the special contact lenses, or they're they're trying to find the pair of contact lenses that would allow Cora to escape to uh, escape the uh, retinal scans and get it on the airplane. The the, the, the papers of transit, the letters of transit. That's what these right. are, like in Casablanca. Yeah. Um, gotcha. The Nazis leave. Cora and Axel head out to meet some other freedom fighters who tell them that Krebs is dead, baby, and the contacts are missing. Uh, the Nazis. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And the dude with the letters of transit who got shot and gave him Peter Lor- or Peter Lorry killed and took him from. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. I just keep seeing like the little things that connect. Uh, the Nazis raid the bail bondsman's place. And use their brain movie machine to discover that Barb was the one who captured Krebs. And I love that they all have their own files on the table while they're playing poker. <laughs> yes. Their own criminal files. Yes. <laughs> they do, don't they? They, they do. Because that's how the Nazis identify them after. Yeah. Oh, it, it was this person. Oh, my God. <laughs> Don't bring bring your your criminal criminal records records to your underground poker game. Clint shows up and asks Barb to take the contacts, but she refuses, so he stashes them in her club for safekeeping in Sam's piano. Um, Cora and Axel. Uh, In the kitchen. In the kitchen underneath (laughs) the Underneath the sink. Uh, I know. (laughs) Um, So Cora and Axel show back up at Barb's place. They ask her to help them again. She refuses. Then the Nazis show up and bust up her club. After the Nazis leave, her blind brother discovers the contacts and gives them to Barb. 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 (laughs) Just the head of the PTA. (laughs) Uh, Rather than give the lenses to Cora and Axel, Barb heads out and meets with Big Fatso, the leader of the Junkyard Gang. (laughs) (laughs) There was one guy, so, like, the Junkyard Gang, they all, like, looked like Mad Max, like, leather Mad Max future stuff. One dude just had a random circuit board glued to the middle of his bare (laughs) chest. (laughs) No one else would hire him. (sighs) So, uh, Uh, Big Big Fatso spent all of his time in a bulldozer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In the, the, the shovel, uh-huh. the shovel of a, a bulldozer. Uh, couldn't I? I mean, if if you had a, a beef against Big Fatso, like if you were one of his men, uh-huh. wouldn't you just like leave him up there, and, like, <laughs> never let him down? Yeah. Absolutely. Until no, Big started. Fatso had a lot of trust in his goodies. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thought about what he did. Yeah, he did. That's true. He can't chase you. Yeah, no. Well, he, he's not personally dangerous. And his greatest weakness is that he's in a basket. Like, it's not enclosed on top. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's his, that's his single right. weakness. Like, they could have just dumped him at any time. Just, yeah. yeah. They'd been like, oh, my bad. Well, and what was, what, what Can would you get big, yourself up? Like, yeah. What would Big Fatso do? He's not going to come get you. Well, I mean, also, they could just dump him from up there and he would die. Yeah. He would oh, just yeah. die. Absolutely. From like, like get me to the top of a hill <laughs> so I can roll down it. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. Hell yeah. Oh, he's using himself as a battle, as a battle implement. There was a similar character on the show, Gotham, that, that was done. Hmm. Better. <laughs> I think many concepts in this film were done better in other places. But he's sitting—he's sitting at a table in an alley eating a chicken leg. 
or turkey leg. I, I think, though, to that point, bro, that this movie intentionally stretches all of these tropes to their breaking point. I don't think that any of this was unintentional. I don't know how much intentionality was in this. I mean... I, I mean, yes, yes, there was, okay, yeah. okay, I mean, fair, fair, but, but like, Big Fat So is made, made to be funny. She, she throws, throws donuts, donuts at him, and he goes, goes ooh, donuts. Like, <laughs> yeah. like there's, there's no subtlety or It was just so character. clumsily made. Every yeah. shot and edit looked like it was, was. It looked like shaky <laughs> handy cam when they were in the freaking uh, scrapyard. I was like, why, why are we shooting from below like this? At first, I thought they were going to meet Tuco. <laughs> <laughs> but also like the scene where she does that like where she tries to look like the comic book character where she sticks her leg out from like the edge of the table yeah. and holding the guns she so gingerly gently and slowly placed herself in that position <laughs> like this this is the, the, the editing of the, of the uh, that I forgot about that the, the shooting inside, inside the room, room that's, that's like the, the worst example of two people shooting at each other inside a room in any movie yeah, I've ever seen because they're, they're both like Captain Kirk, Kirk rolling around yeah and then getting up and just shooting at each other again yeah and then rolling around and then and at the end he comes out and congratulates her on a shootout well done <laughs> like, yeah. yeah yeah it's the weirdest it's the weirdest thing ever as far as gun violence goes in the movie. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Big Fatso is going to buy the lenses from her and then resell them on the black market. Barb wants a million cash, Canadian, and an arm escort to the airport. Uh, uh, for which he bargains her down to 750000 Yes. And because of the arm the armed escort. Yeah. Um, her brother, meanwhile, goes to the rebel hideout. So he was just shot of him walking around with his his cane. Yeah. <laughs> Jude just turned to me and was like, where the hell am I? <laughs> oh, I was thinking the, when the Nazis were interrogating him about where Force D was, I wanted him to be like, I haven't seen her! <laughs> Oh, did, oh, did we, we miss, miss the, the blind, blind leading the blind, blind joke? Yeah. God. Yeah, yeah when, when, when Tamira Morrison comes, comes around the corner, corner and he's like, he's like, he's like I, I can help you. you. But, but at the end, he goes, looks, looks like the blind's leading the blind. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Just like, it groaned so hard at that joke. Because it's the most obvious thing you can have a blind character say, that it's so stupid to have him say it. So... <laughs> Anyway, yeah. this movie, this two okay, people, this two this, people wrote it. this movie was the cinematographic equivalent of Limp Biscuits music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what though? But this fucks, and Limp Biscuit does not. Oh, I don't know if it fucks, Brian. Like I this really movie don't, fucks, man. This movie fucks. This I'm I, gonna rewatch this movie again. I hated I was so every minute of watching this movie. It was 98 minutes, and I thought they could have cut a solid 30 of them. <laughs> Your TV special? Yeah. I mean, it probably would have flowed a little bit better uh, with less time. Yeah. Well, yeah, it could have been like a WB show. Yeah, this would have been a really cool TV show, I think. I think it would have been better as a TV show, absolutely. Oh, they, it would have yeah, had less nipples. nipples. Fewer nipples, nipples. Sorry. That's true. Fewer. Um, more Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this, though. Honestly, Pam Anderson was at her hottest without her nipples exposed in this movie. There were so many times where I was like, oh, god damn. I forgot. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm too young for Pam Anderson to be like the sex icon that I think she was like for your guys' age. Yeah, I don't know. She was never my jam. Like, I can recognize no. that she is an attractive woman, but she was never what I dug, female-wise. Yeah. No. Fake boobs and airbrush. Yeah, that was never my favorite. Yeah. But, um, but there's, there's something, something about, about her personality, personality that I always liked, and I can't put oh, my finger on it. I never found her obnoxious, like a lot of Playboy models who tried to be, you know, sort of forced into the mainstream. Yeah, yeah, not no, no. sure why, but I, I was kind of liked her. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to talk shit about Pam Anderson in general. She's like a perfectly like like she she got a rough time because of being a sex symbol, and she did not deserve right. that. And she's a seemed like a perfectly nice human. Um, she seems normal. Yeah, as, as normal, normal as you can, can be. Being right. 
the Michael Jordan. Her trying to be like tough and gruff in this movie was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I really I appreciated. Wanted- I really appreciated her dry, deadpan yeah. delivery. But when she tried to Rest. talk like Batman sometimes, I was like, I yeah. want a million Canadian. I love the Batman things, though. Man. And well, and when she says to the schoolgirl, haven't you seen Batman? <laughs> she says it in the most Michael Keaton voice she can muster. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so um yeah she finds her so her brother gets tortured to death by prizer barb shows up and finds his body hanging then cora and axel show up and they're like what happened (laughs) (laughs) she Uh, just just before that barb gives the bar to curly and gives him camille Camille as well yeah which we haven't mentioned camille oh yeah. yeah The, who bites the, like, the package the package checker yeah um package checker so yeah she, at the airport <laughs> Barb agrees to help Cora and Axel get out because it's what her brother would have wanted they head out to meet Fatso but he double crosses Barb when Barb Axel and Cora show up at the junkyard <laughs> Colonel Prizer and his Stormtroopers are there, along with the chief of police. Well, apparently, it would seem that Barb is double-crossing Axel and Cora because she gives him, supposedly gives him the lenses. It would seem, yes. Um, <laughs> so Chief Willis pretends to arrest Barb, but secretly slips her a hand grenade. Barb uses the grenade to kill Fatso and cause a commotion. They jump in Barb's armored van and drive away. We get a big car chase. I, I, I love, love the blocking of the grenade thing. thing. Officer, handcuff, handcuff these, these people. people. And he hands, hands her a grenade, and her hand yeah. comes up over her head. If you were surrounded by a firing squad, they'd be like, that guy didn't handcuff her. Let's, Let's kill, kill all of them. them. She yeah. has a grenade. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a complaint. I'm just, I just love that that is what happened. I just love it. Her hands up above her head, and no one is going like, oh. oh. No, instead it's like, grenade! And everyone really? scatters. But let's see run. how this plays out. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it culminates in a hand to hand fight between Barb and Colonel Prizer on a forklift suspended yeah. by a crane above the harbor. So, so it, it was, was the, the motorcycle, motorcycle between, between the car and the forklift, forklift right? Because her, her car got, her bike got smashed between them. Yeah. And yeah. And then she yeah. got stuck. Stuck a little bit. Yeah. She with her boot. She couldn't get her stiletto boot out. <laughs> there, this, this is, is the, the most, most mousetrap mouse <laughs> fight scene <laughs> location <laughs> ever. I, I fucking loved watching, watching it again and seeing, seeing the little steps, steps getting, getting closer to the set piece that they were so obsessed with having. It's like a bunch like a, a bunch, bunch of kids, kids wanted to remake their own James Bond movie. <laughs> I, I loved uh, Prizer laughing maniacally for two minutes. Oh my god! <laughs> As he's forklifting her around, <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> that dude was having the time of his life. He's like, "What do you need me to do? What What does my character do?" <laughs> he's like, "This is why I ran for Congress." <laughs> Uh, so they go to the airport. Barb reveals she still has the contact lenses. Um, she gives them to Cora, who puts them in immediately. Where, Where did she, she keep them? In her mouth? Cora's going to get pink In her eyes. eyes. Yeah, they were in her eyes. She was wearing them. Didn't wash them. Oh, that's, that's right. She didn't have that's how you get pink eye. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cora's getting pink eye, for sure. Um, hey, but I also want to say that... <laughs> In 2017, this was a lot like what it was like getting to an airport. <laughs> they actually cured pink eye? <laughs> in this, this in, Oh, yes, that's what in, it's about. In 2015? Did we, get, did we talk we did about it. the disease, the weapon? Yeah. The, oh, oh, yeah, we kind of... We kind of uh, HIV? Yeah, they the called HIV. It red, minutes. They called it Red Ribbon, which is kind of... It's so cringy. Yes. So much of this, like it, the, the the 
the HIV thing, so fucking 90s. To use it as a weapon, mm -hmm. as a thing that we don't understand. It's still but by 90s, But by 96, we were moving past that. Like, yes. in, the, in the 80s, it was certainly huge, you know, yeah, because it was like, you could get it on a toilet seat. But by 96, like, we had a, a decent understanding. Yeah. It, it made me think of the same thing with the, uh, the doctor, Cora D changing her face from a clearly dark-skinned black woman to a much lighter-skinned black woman who then gets fucking blue eyes at the very end of the movie. Uh, <laughs> Just like, it's one of those things where I'm, I'm sure that somebody thought like, oh, this will show how colorblind we are, you know, because it's the 90s and that's how people are viewing things. Like, I assume that the HIV thing was like, we're showing that anybody can get it. Like, yeah, sure, but no. But yeah, because yeah, you, you could have just said deadly virus or yes. you know incurable virus or whatever. But instead, it's, it's HIV. But then it's a super strain of HIV, and the nickname given is red ribbon, which is what people wear to support AIDS yes. awareness uh -huh. and show. And so it's just like that it's was gross. all added. Yeah, it's gross. It's like, all gross. It yeah, it wasn't it's, necessary. Virus it's one thing is enough. That, it's, it's one, one thing, thing to do that with the sexuality because your protagonist is buxom blonde, known for her bod, whatever. But it's another thing to do that about race and a very specific illness. Like it just was, it's so weird to see the 90s comfort around these kinds of things. And the sexuality thing has aged, I think, better than the race thing, you know, like, and the views on HIV. But, but I, I think, think that it's all born, born from the same thing, thing of like, no, we're, we're just showing how it's okay to talk about. about. Nothing, Nothing is taboo. Like, uh, oh, I don't think anybody thought twice. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, not for a second. A single person, no. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Cora and Axel get on the plane to Canada. <laughs> while <laughs> Spirit, Spirit Airlines. Yeah. While Willis and Barb remain on the rain-swept tarmac. And I think this and is that's when I turned to uh, Andrea and I was like, the problems of two people don't amount to a hill of beans, but I hadn't caught everything before that. <laughs> yeah. I hear Paris is nice this time of year. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. That. Yeah. See. So my my first unanswered qu uh, credits roll and my first unanswered question with this movie is first of all, how dare you? <laughs> and <laughs> secondly. Um, what the fuck <laughs> is up with this? Movie? That's the thing. It wasn't one of those where like, this is so far out. I don't get it. Or this is so trippy and weird. I don't get it. It was just, I don't get it. Like, <laughs> like what, what was that? I honestly, I turned off my brain, relaxed, and just floated through this whole movie. It, was, it went down easy. Yeah. It was we entertaining. Laughed. We laughed plenty. Oh, I yeah. Laughed so a hard. I didn't... It, I don't ever want to see it again. No. Oh, I do. Yeah, no, no, no. Like like, like awesome. Roger said, it wasn't boring. It did. I, I I was really struggling, though, to keep up with, like, the intricacies of the plot because I was just zoning yeah. out. <laughs> um, well, because they seemed intricate. And then you start paying attention, and it's just getting to Canada again. Yeah. Oh, that, well, and that's my, my question is we're doing all of this to get her the contacts so she can get into Canada. Right, right. The, virus the virus isn't even a... Like, vocal. Yeah, yeah, the virus isn't a part of it, really, but can we just get her to Canada? Like, what's on the border of Canada that she needs these contacts to get through? Like, can we just jump that fence at the end of the movie instead of her scanning her fucking eyeballs? Can we steal that airplane and go to Canada? Because that seems easier right. than all of this to get the contact. Right, right. See, that, that's the thing. That's the thing is that in Casablanca, Rick was, he wasn't, he wasn't a bounty hunter mercenary who was like badass and could fight and shoot and drive motorcycles. If you're that, just go to Canada. <laughs> right? <laughs> She's, She's fucking Wolverine. Take the kid to now. Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 There are, there are neutral zones in the United States, but I guess we've closed off the borders for the intense. But also, Steel City isn't a neutral zone, apparently, because just the airport is like, it's all very so, confusing. Steel. Uh, there was an unoccupied zone. 
between Steel City and the airport or something. I like that Al keeps insisting. Like a parking lot? Keeps insisting that and correcting us on calling it the neutral zone. <laughs> Unoccupied <laughs> zone. Political scientist Al. I think we know what side Al is. Uh, so remember, remember, remember a time uh, when we just <laughs> left our, when we couldn't stream things and we just left our TVs on yeah. to, uh, you, you know, just constantly, uh, it just whatever was, was on. Was on. Which, was is, on. which is why I know about Miss Cleo and Jerry Springer, yeah. Or, or we would change the channel or, or something like that. Right. Uh, it, if this was that time. And yeah, I, I think, think 96, 96 was still that time. Uh, yeah. and, and barbed wire, wire showed up on, on my cable. Uh, I'd probably just not change the channel. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is I, that, I, I, wa- I watched a, a lot of garbage because the TV was too far away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no, you're right, Al. If, if this happened on, on a Sunday afternoon... <laughs> I would not have gotten up to change the channel. I would have just let it play. Uh, so, all right. Any final? Like Brian, I had fun with this movie. Yeah. 10 out of 10. I didn't hate it. Best movie ever. I, I'm done with it. <laughs> but I didn't hate it. I, 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 I had fun, but I also hated it. Yeah. You had fun, fun hating it. it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah fair. <laughs> like Limp Biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing like, like Limp Biscuit. The moment <laughs> I hear Limp Biscuit, I do everything in my power to turn it off. Just stop hearing Limp Biscuit. Yes. <laughs> more, more, more like <laughs> Motley Crue. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Yes. yeah like Methods it. of yep. Mayhem. <laughs> Proposition. Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, we talk, That was all off air. Our, our, our listeners have no idea what we're talking about. All right. <laughs> Any final thoughts before we move on? I think we covered them. Yeah. Again, I, I don't understand the science virus aspect, but whatever. I think Willis was about my low-key favorite character in this movie. Yeah. Was that the butler? Oh, no, no that was the, the chief. Moderate. Oh, the chief. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. He was fine. The fact that he got dressed up when the Nazis came. In an old timey Bobby type. I I do I do do like like that he had a reversal in his arc. Yeah. Yeah. Like he ended up being Team Barbed Wire. Mike Claude Rains. Well (laughs) and what is what does he say at the end? I think I'm falling in love. She goes, get in line. And then (laughs) that's the last line. (laughs) What's with the gunshots though? (laughs) <laughs> am I am I to believe that she just murdered him on the tarmac? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I didn't want to leave Morocco after all. <laughs> uh, so, all right, that is it for barbed wire. We may be pining for the halcyon days of barbed wire, though, because next oh, week no. we are watching Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Turbo. Oh, <laughs> I hate these movies so much. This this was There's the so many. This was no, no yeah, and this is the only other theatrically released one, the one that I literally didn't know it existed until we were <laughs> past when we should have done it, which is why we're tacking it on at the end. Oh my goodness. <sighs> yeah. All right. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Turbo next week on Harmless Phosphorescence. Until then, this has been your host Rose Smiley. And if you watch Barbed Wire, you're going to regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, <laughs> but soon <laughs> and for the rest of your life. Rest of your... Perfect. I'm Josh Cece, and I also carry my debit card in a metal briefcase. I'm Ryan Lesh, not Clint Howard. Mallory Weber, if anybody asks, I'm taking a bubble bath. <laughs> if anyone asks. Where's Al? At least taking a bubble bath. What's Al doing? Until, Until I'm tender, tender as a Tuscan veal. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We'll see you next time, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys.